All right, so we have our, our two guinea pig pigs over there who tried the uh, the coal bed. You y'all want to just give us the uh, the rundown real quick, and then maybe we'll we'll ask some pointed questions. Our friends tucked us in with a nice thick cattail blanket, about maybe six inches thick, or maybe even more. And um, then we they put um, a thinner wool blanket on top of us because to cover our faces because it was snowing. A couple times I woke up to take off layers because I was just too hot. And um, also I, I noticed some heat by my head a couple times. And I, I kind of like rearranged my pillow, which was my um, winter jacket. And um, sometimes I flipped it over and it was really hot. And I was like, oh, I didn't really think much of it. But um, yeah. <laughs> so then I think it was about four in the morning I really I'm not exactly sure but um I woke up and I w my head was really hot and then I flipped flipped over my ski jacket and it there goes some smoke and steam and, um, there's a huge hole in the blanket and in the um, jacket so to fix the problem <laughs> so we could try to go back to sleep we just put some more dirt on and it was totally fine and we flipped the wool blanket just made a flap over it it was perfectly fine, and there was still the middle was still really warm e even now in the morning. So it, it's really effective, and it was it was quite luxurious, but a little too hot at point some point. But would you change anything up? Would you wear you'd wear less layers? Wear perhaps yeah. non polyurethane? <laughs> I would have um, felt more comfortable taking my ski pants off, but I probably would have done the same thing that I did with my jacket and just kind of leave it on the edge of the blanket, mm. um, just to keep as a barrier, and um, worn just long underwear, maybe even just a t-shirt and long yeah. underwear. Maybe just like what you fine. wear, what you wear to bed in your like pajamas would be perfect. Cause <laughs> wow. It's, it's all a I lot had... hotter than what you would keep your bedroom temperature. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all I have... So, maples, ashes, dogwoods, horse chestnut group, and Caprifoliaceae are all opposite branching. Like us, we're opposite branching. We have one arm opposite another arm. Okay? Well, unless you get battered by the storms of existence, and then your arm gets broken. Just like these trees. If you were to look at the old growth of this tree, there's nothing opposite branching about it. So to identify these trees, Go to the newest growth where you'll find opposite branching, okay? That's small little twigs at the end that are only two, one to two years of age are going to be less weathered and more regular or true to form. When we're looking at species specific identifiers, especially in winter, nothing beats looking at the buds. What I'd like you to do right now is come up to one of these of buds which are the future sites of leaves and also the future sites of branches. There must be a leaf before there can be a branch. Go up there and I want you to count how many bud scales you see on these single buds. Look at the terminal bud because they're the biggest buds, okay? How are they arranged? Do they overlap? These features are the best way to determine species in the winter when um, bark can be similar. The older the bark is, the more striated and cracked it becomes. Lichens prefer maples. You can't tell tree species by bark color or texture alone. So remember, branching pattern, the bud characteristics, the amount of scales in their arrangement, and then bark just as a, a, a qualifier. It's those three together that will allow you to have a better or a more accurate determination as to what tree species you're dealing with. Because in hemlock stands, you're gonna find moist soils, okay? The cool part about hemlocks is because their needles are so dark, they absorb the radiant heat of the day, even on a day like today where it's overcast, and they retain it through the night. Most deer yards, wherever there's hemlocks, are underneath the hemlocks because it creates that thermal uh, air that keeps the air warmer at night and cooler in the day. 
So should we take that into consideration with shelter location for ourselves? Right. You don't want, well. You don't want to put your shelter in a hemlock stand only because the soils are going to be moist and dense. I mean, in, during the winter time. In the winter time, that might yeah, it might work to your advantage. The snow underneath the hemlock canopy is um, more porous and granular, and it's less deep than the surrounding snow. If you look where Ruben's feet are sinking it's in, about thing. four and a half inches. Under the hemlock, it's about two. It's more crystalline. Too. Right. And that again is because the hemlock has this ability to hold the heat of the day and release it during the night. Remember I said hemlocks make great rakes for raking up debris or raking coals to the side? All right. These dead and dying branches in the understory are still springy and rugged and they make great rakes. I used to paddle my debris, uh, but Maine at one point was all farm. There was hardly any forest. And as a result, there were farm dumps, and I lost the tip of my finger to a mason jar that was Ooh. under the leaf litter. Uh, from that point forward, I decided I was going to make rakes. They go, the, the rakes make things go a lot quicker. You don't get exhausted as fast because you're not bending over all the time. And in black fly season, you rake up your piles in a spiral pattern, and then you go back and pick them up in the same spiral pattern, keeping you always moving. And if you're moving, the black flies don't land on you and bite you. They just swarm, you know, and they don't even swarm that bad as long as you're moving. So little techniques like that, using this hemlock rake, uh, rake helps. Um, the question was, do hemlocks make a good uh, indicator of shelter location? Not so much in the three seasons without snow because they indicate that the soil is going to be damp and dense and increased conduction. But where it's winter time, you might be able to take advantage of that phenomenon of the thermal release during the night, just like the deer do when they yard up. We could use hemlock as an indicator of uh, red squirrel and porcupine for easy meat sources. In strong decoctions, hemlock becomes a mild sedative. It's very relaxing. It's a unique sensation. Take a needle and roll it in your fingers and you'll notice you can. Unlike the hemlock and the balsam fir, the spruce needles don't have a flat cross section. You can roll them with ease. They're angular. Remember, spiny spruce friendly fur. And it's not going to poke you and give you acupuncture issues. Um, but because these needles are angular, they have more substance to them and they'll keep you off the ground more, preventing conduction more effectively than those flattened balsam fir or hemlock boughs. Uh, and pine, there's nowhere near the density of biomass in a pine, whether it's a white or a red pine group that these have to offer. Spruce is the best bedding material. Okay. Spruce gum from black spruce or white spruce has been used and sold commercially in Maine historically. Um, you chew it. Of course, in the beginning, it feels like it's going to rip out all of your dental work. But after you work it for a while, it gets nice and chewable and it does have the same texture as a chewing gum. How many calories are you investing versus how many calories are, are, are coming back to you when you're harvesting little tiny hemlock cones for those minuscule seeds versus those big robust white pine, relatively speaking, cones, right? So just keep that in mind.